Hello everybody, my name is Rebecca Bell. I work here at Old Sturbridge Village as the Collections Manager and Curator of Textiles. And today we're here to show off our newest exhibit, Needle and Thread, the Art and Scale of Clothing in Early 19th Century New England Family. The exhibit is really highlighting all of the work that early 19th century women went through to create garments for their families. And you'll see this as you go throughout the village and interact with our costumed historians, which in many cases are wearing replicas of garments that we have in the collection. And you might even see them working on some clothing pieces in some of the houses. And it really did take a great amount of time to not only make these clothes for the family, but also to maintain them and make sure that they were neat and tidy and in good order for uh, years to come. Sewing was a really important skill for folks in the 19th century, and oftentimes girls were learning at a really young age of three, four, five years old, really as soon as they could manage a needle. And this was not only a practical skill that they would take later in life, but also they then would be able to help the family with some of these monumental sewing tasks. Um, you might start them with an easy task like hemming some sheets, and then by the time they progressed, to say a teenager, they would be capable of helping make their own clothes. And this is all aided by a lot of sewing tools, some of which you could purchase at a local store, such as uh, the Ace and Knight store here at the village, and some things you could make yourselves, uh, such as the pincushion in the case behind me, and one of my favorite objects, which is the Hasif. It is basically a rolled sewing case that you can put any of your sewing tools and notions in, roll it up, and then tuck it into your basket or into your pocket and immediately have all of your sewing tools that you might need at the ready when you are in need of them. In the 1830s here in New England, the average family size was about seven to eight individuals, children and adults. And that meant that there were quite a number of garments that needed to be created and maintained for the family, starting with your undergarments, such as shifts and stays and petticoats and shirts, and moving through the garments such as gowns and tailcoats and vests and trousers that would be worn by the family. Folks in the 19th century, in this area in particular, are also dealing with not only different occasions, work versus a uh, dressier occasion, but also cold weather. So not only would you need garments suitable for the spring and summer, but you would need to have garments suitable for the winter and the fall. And that would include not only warmer gowns and warmer tailcoats, but also outerwear such as capes and cloaks and the like. And this means that folks in the 19th century, even though individually they may not have had quite as many clothes as we do in the modern day with our overstuffed closets, there were still quite a few different pieces of family garments that needed to be not only created, but maintained over the course of the year. With all the clothes that 19th century families had to make, one important task was making sure that they were well maintained to increase their longevity. And this was accomplished in a few ways. Laundry and ironing were weekly tasks that folks had to accomplish. And in doing the weekly laundry and ironing, women could also be checking the clothes to make sure that they didn't have any holes or tears that needed to be attended to. Laundry is a little different than we might know today. Folks were usually doing their laundry in large wash tubs with washboards. And some families may have opted for a newfangled washing machine, which is a large tub and an insert that has fingers or paddles that will agitate the clothes when you crank a handle. Not necessary, but some families may have opted for that. Ironing too looks a little different in the early 19th century from ironing today. An ironing board might be as simple as a table covered with a blanket and a sheet pinned down as your ironing surface. Again, some families may have opted for something fancier with an ironing settle, which is a table that can flip down when you're ready to use it for ironing. And when it's not in use, it gets flipped up into a seat so that table surface becomes nice and clean and protected. Again, not very necessary, but some families might have opted for a convenience like that. In addition to laundry and ironing, a really important task to keep your clothes in good order was making sure that you took care of any small tears or holes before they got to be large tears and holes and you ended up having to put your clothing in the rag bag. And this was usually something that was taken care of as time allowed and as you found the, the small holes that needed to be attended to. It might be as simple as a patch on an elbow, such as the child's garment in the case next to me, or it might be a little bit uh, more of a repair job, a larger repair job, such as the stockings in the case next to me. 
which are a wonderful pair of factory-made machine knit silk stockings that somebody has cared for so well that when they got holes in the toes and heels, rather than throwing them out like we might do today, they opted to cut off the parts of the sock that were damaged and use two additional cotton factory-made stockings to piece in a new heel and a new sole to those stockings. When you put on the shoes, nobody's going to see all of the men's on your feet and you can keep wearing those stockings for months, years to come. Not only were folks creating full garments for themselves, but accessories were an important part of bringing the outfits together. And these included uh, really interesting accessories such as the tippet in the case next to me, which is one of my favorites. It is made out of milkweed, which is a bit unusual. The milkweed was collected and sewn into little tufts, and those tufts were then sewn to a backing fabric before the entire tippet was lined in a beautiful yellow silk that had been quilted. So you can imagine that a lady wearing this must have felt very elegant. It really mimics the appearance of fur and is very lustrous and soft and wonderful looking. Other accessories that women and men might have worn would be gloves, uh, caps, other types of collars such as white work embroidered collars, cuffs, uh, small bags such as little reticules, and those accessories would really be important to completing the, the overall look of the outfit. Clothing a family was a lot of work, but women were not doing this entirely alone. Certainly there was a lot of help from family members creating these garments, but also there were lots of professionals that women could seek out to help them make their garments. Whether it was seeking out a, a dressmaker or a tailor to construct a full garment, or seeking out their services to pattern a dress or cut out a, a tailcoat, for instance, and then they would take those home and sew them themselves. Um, we have a lot of references in our research library to folks doing just that. And we're lucky enough to have some account books from people in those trades, such as the account book of William Kate, who was a tailor working from the early 1800s well into the 1830s, sometimes for the same client over multiple decades. And Zuru Higley Caswell, who was up in Castleton, Vermont, and offering her sewing services to local community members as well. And her account book is not only full of listings for the services she's providing, but also the supplies that she's purchasing and the fabrics that she's purchasing as well. Another example might be a milliner that you go to to get the latest style of bonnet, such as this example in the case next to me that was made by Mrs. P. Hinckley working um, into the 1840s in Hartford, Connecticut. Clothing a 19th century family was certainly a lot of work, as you can see, but it really was an effort that women by and large, we're doing a lot of the work themselves, but they certainly had a lot of ways to ease that burden, whether seeking out professionals like mantua makers and dressmakers, advice books like the Workman's Guide, or just other members of the family and extended family as well coming together to help create these garments and maintain them.